Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about really a, a legacy of research that's involved a lot of people. And I first want to acknowledge uh, the contr contributors to this work, including Leanne Lestak and Kohan Yang, who are really kind of the main drivers behind the development of this work, but also my colleagues, Keith Musselman, Carl Ricker, Jeff Deems, Tom Painter, the whole team at the Airborne Snow Observatories, colleagues at the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, at the California Department of Water Resources, at NASA, and at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, as many of you know, the mountain snowpack is a very important source of water supply across the globe. And some recent work by Immerzeel et al. published in Nature showed through an index of snow water supply and snow water demand, the areas of the globe that have a particular interest in understanding how water supplies vis-a-vis uh, -vis snowpack and glacier melt are changing. Um, and you can see those areas, of course, in our backyard in the Western United States, in parts of Central Asia, and across the American Cordillera in the Andes Mountains. And in totality, when we look at a map like this and the graphs on the, the bar graphs on the right side, I won't go into detail on, but they give you a sense as to the vast populations across the globe that depend on the cryosphere for their water supply. On the order of 1 billion people across the globe depend on snowmelt for their water supply. Now, a little closer to home in the Western United States, there's been a lot of research done on how the snowpack has been sensitive to changes in climate. Uh, most of those studies have focused on how the magnitude of snow water equivalent has changed over the last century. And a more recent study by Keith Musselman that I collaborated on showed that not only is the snow water equivalent changing, but if you actually look at the amount of snow melt that occurs during the winter period, the amount of snow melt has actually increased over time. And that signal of the winter snow melt condition, which is very sensitive to temperature, is actually more widespread in terms of that climate sensitivity than the changes in snow water equivalent. And this has an important uh, implication for the hydrology because after all it's snow melt, right? That is the driver of runoff in this region. Now, in light of these changes, if I can get the slide to advance. In light of these changes, my graduate student, Kate Hale, who just defended her PhD uh, earlier this year, developed an analysis of the uh, snow water storage in the context of not only the magnitude of snow water storage, but also the duration of storage. Okay, so, so one of the things I can still see the, the map well enough, but one of the things that Kate's work highlights is that if you look at an index of the snowpack, not just from the standpoint of the magnitude of snow water equivalent, but also in the context of the duration at which that water is stored in the snowpack, you get a different picture about the climate sensitivity of the snowpack um, over time. And so this, these two maps show from the period 1950 to 2013, based on the variable infiltration capacity model, the changes in this snow storage index over that period of time. And you can see the widespread signal across the region shows that the snow water storage index um, is decreasing. Um, and so all of this leads into, okay, so, so these climate signals that I've just showed you vis-a-vis -vis the snowpack um, have important implications for water security. And the context of the, the three eyes of water security, which I'm presenting here, being uh, housed in, in information, institutions, and infrastructure, where at a place like the National Snow and Ace Data Center, we often think about that being a purveyor of information. And the institutions that might use that information, of course, are wide and varied. Um, in my neck of the woods, that tends to be uh, the various institutions that are involved in water resource management. 
um, who are responsible for maintaining the infrastructure that stores and delivers water to the public. And when I look at a graph like this and think about the arrows between the three eyes, I've increasingly found that I'm becoming an arrow. Um, I think I started my career as a purveyor of information and developing new techniques for estimating the distribution of snow water equivalent. But over time, as the water resources management community has come to the table and really pressed those of us on the research side to get engaged in the water resource management process, Increasingly, I find that I'm spending more and more time being an arrow that provides um, information to institutions, but not just sort of throwing the data over the fence, but actually being heavily involved in the process of how the data is interpreted. And I think that for an NSIDC audience, that's kind of a, a take home point that I want to bring to bear here is that with the explosion of information that exists out there and really the incredible information that an organization like NSIDC is providing, we, we kind of need a rally call for more and more researchers to get involved in being arrows to connect that information to institutions through long-term development of relationships so that you can become trusted sources of that information. Um, and I'll speak more to that toward the end of the seminar. Now, um, sorry, my, my meeting controls keep popping up, so I gotta hide them again. Now, <clears throat> this is kind of giving you the punchline for the seminar in a given uh, slide at the beginning. And I kind of dropped this in at the last minute because um, one of the things that we've been working on as a team is to develop real-time snow water equivalent information for the Sierra Nevada and Southern Rocky Mountain region. And this is again through a collaboration with the California Department of Water Resources. And what I'm showing you here is the March one. So we're now a couple of weeks past when we delivered this data, but this is the March 1st of this year, snow water equivalent for the Sierra, um, shown in the second map from right in the blues. Um, the percent of averages on a pixel by pixel basis is shown in the, um, graph just to the right of that. And you can see that those areas in the lighter to darker greens are on the order of 200 to 300% of average to date. So two to three times the amount of snow that would typically exist in the Sierras at this time of year. And the map on the far right represents the percent of average by watershed. If you look at the actual numbers in each polygon, that represents the percent of average of snow water equivalent by watershed um, for the date of interest, in this case, March 1st of this year. Now, I've got, you know, I, for those of us that love snow, this is super exciting to see this amount of um, water stored in the snowpack, uh, but it represents a significant flood hazard. Um, and just to give you a sense of kind of the, the magnitude, the, the MODIS true color image on the right, in the 15 years that Leanne and I have been doing this so we reporting, I don't think we've ever seen the snow extent over California so high. I grew up in Santa Barbara. These are the San Inez Mountains in Santa Barbara County down here at the bottom. I think this is the first time I've ever seen continuous snow cover from those mountains um, in Santa Barbara County all the way up into the Sierra Nevada. So a really incredible amount of snowfall has occurred and all indications is that this is gonna break the record this year for snowfall um, in California. Um, so this is kind of, I'm going to walk you through um, in the next uh, 30 minutes or so how we generate these snow water equivalent products. And it follows a kind of a long legacy that actually goes back to one of the first seminars that I ever gave at NSIDC, which has now been several years and many of you probably weren't part of the organization then. Um, but that's kind of where the roadmap here. So to give you the roadmap, we're going to... Um, the objective is to support water resources decision making with more accurate real time spatial snow water equivalent estimates. In part one, um, I want to make the argument that hindsight is beneficial, that product evaluations, so SWE products here, evaluations of SWE products show that spatial SWE estimates based on reanalysis are often more accurate than real time models. So I'll make the case that. Um, 
re, that hindsight is beneficial. And SWE reconstructions are a big part of that. In part two, I will argue that moving from hindsight to real time is an essential uh, development in SWE monitoring and that utilizing SWE reanalyses in real time models can improve those SWE estimates. So basically the present um, has analogs in the past that we should exploit to come up with the best possible estimates of SWE in real time. And then in part three, if there's time, I'll illustrate some examples in the context of evaluating natural hazards associated with drought and flood risk. Okay, so what do we mean by um, sort of hindsight? And so I want to start this concept of thinking about the benefit of hindsight by just illustrating two ways that we can think about snow accumulation on the ground. We can run a snow melt model forward in time, force that model with meteorological data, including precipitation and temperature, so that the model will dictate whether or not that precipitation is falling as rain or as snow, and we can build up a snowpack. And based on those meteorological forcings, we can simulate the snow melt through time. And it turns out when you look at basically all hydrologic models, the precipitation forcing and the precipitation type often represents the largest source of uncertainty in the model and that the uncertainty in the meteorological forcings that are controlling the snow energy exchange and the melt are less significant than the uncertainty in the precipitation forcing. And that's the sort of basis of a SWE reconstruction is that if, a, if you can use a satellite observation to tell you when the snow disappears, and if you have relatively adequate estimates of the snow atmosphere en energy exchange and the snow melt flux, you can run the model backward and rebuild the snowpack to its maximum accumulation. And that's in a nutshell what a SWE reconstruction is. Um, both have their benefits and their drawbacks, okay? So the idea here is to be able to exploit the benefits of both types of modeling approaches um, and in particular to, in the context of real-time snow water equivalent estimation, to leverage the benefits of SWE reconstructions. And so in this kind of first stage, I want to make the case that SWE reconstructions provide information that can be used um, to estimate the distribution of snow water equivalent. Um, so a little primer on SWE reconstruction models, they use um, the energy balance to recover the amount of snow prior to melt. Uh, they require adequate estimates of the snowpack energy balance, as well as satellite observed observations of snow covered area. And the products that I'm going to show you a comparison of for the Sierra Nevada include the original simulations that were an extension of my dissertation work um, that I collaborated on, on with a postdoc published in 2013. Um, this is the sort of initial reconstruction or rec int, um, and then sort of a reconstruction 2.0 that Ned Bear and Carl Ricker developed, um, published in 2016, which we're going to call rec parball. Um, so two different sort of types of reconstructions, rec reconstruction 1.0 and reconstruction 2.0, if you will. Um, and then there's what we might consider a reconstruction 3.0 um, or it's actually slightly different than a reconstruction. It actually merges the benefits of a forward model and a reconstruction model, which we call the reconstruction with data simulation or rec DA. And this flow chart, which I won't spend a lot of time on, kind of illustrates how the rec DA works and how it's different from a classic reconstruction. And that basically you um, run a simulation in, in a forward context with a land surface model. And the forcing of precipitation includes ensembles where the ensemble spread represents uh, the full uncertainty in those precipitation estimates um, forced into the land surface model. And that, through that land surface model, can then develop a prior ensemble, so some spread of state variables, a snow water equivalent, snow covered area, and other model states. And then those state variables can be updated through a Bayesian analysis based on satellite observed snow covered area. And that could be done in a posterior context where you can actually um, use this in a smoothing context. So unlike an ensemble common filter, the, this technique employs an ensemble common smoother where the distribution of the um, precipitation is corrected in a backward in time based on 
um, the Bayesian analysis. And so what this basically does is allows you to come up with estimates of the spatial distribution of precipitation in the model based on the satellite observed snow covered area depletion, which in a nutshell is the basis of the reconstruction, but brought into the context of distributing precipitation on the, along the landscape. And therefore you're basically piling snow up in the places where it has been observed to be deepest based on how it's depleting through snow covered area and time. Um, this was published um, initially in 2008, but the Steve Margolis' group at UCLA now has a Western US wide product um, based on this algorithm. So we have the Reconstruction 1.0, uh, the Reconstruction 2.0 from Ned Bear and Carl Ricker, and then this Rec DA from the Margolis team. Um, and so here's all the different products that I'm going to show you kind of the bake off for the Rec Int. Uh, or Reconstruction 1.0, the REC Parball, uh, the REC DA, and then we'll compare SNODAS and the National Water Model SWE. And we're going to compare all these products against different evaluation metrics. We will compare these products against the Airborne Snow Observatory data in the Tuolumne River Basin, against uh, the snow course observations, which are uh, shown by the green triangles across the Sierra Nevada, against the snow sensor locations, which are snow pillows that are managed um, by NRCS and by the California Cooperative Snow Survey. Those are the red uh, stars across the landscape. And so I'll show you these three different, uh, or these five different products evaluated against these three different metrics. Now, one of the things to bring attention to is the extreme interannual variability in snow water equivalent across the Sierra. This is showing, just to illustrate this, the REC in product uh, for peak snow water equivalent from 2000 to 2017, shown as percent of anomaly from the mean snow water equivalent, which is shown on the bottom right. The, the maps that are in red show snow water equivalent estimates that are well below the mean. The maps in blue show snow water equivalent that is well above the mean. So you can see relatively big snow years like 2005, 06, 2011, 2017, um, 2019. And of course, the current year will, would also pop up um, as being dark blue on these maps. And one of the things that you can see here when you look at this is that there are very few years in the Sierra Nevada, these 18 years that are relatively close to the mean. Um, it's really kind of a feast or famine uh, landscape when it comes to snowpack accumulation. And that makes the water management and the SWE modeling particularly difficult, which is why this is a great place to um, work on these problems. Now to start on model evaluation from the Airborne Snow Observatory, um, here's just an example of looking at um, ASO LIDAR for an example date. This is uh, the 3rd of April of 2013. Uh, so the SWE estimate here is based on a depth estimate from the LIDAR and then merged with a priori information about snow density to get SWE. Um, here's the rec in reconstruction for that same time period. And then the difference between the two um, on the right. In this particular case, the mean absolute error was about 13%. Uh, but of course, we have a lot more ASO data than we did at the time when this, when these maps were generated. And so Kuan Yang has done a lot of very in-depth work on evaluating these different products against ASO, which is what I want to show now on the next slide. So now looking at the average SWE residuals for the five different SWE products over 17 ASO flights for um, the Tuolumne River Basin, and these flights cover both relatively low snow years and relatively high snow years. They cover a time period near maximum accumulation and out into the, toward the timing of snow disappearance. And when you look at the magnitude of the differences where the, the red areas are those where the sweet products are underestimating sweet, the blue areas are those where the sweet products are overestimating sweet, you can see that the winners in this evaluation are Rec DA with a lot of whites, so not a lot of blues and reds, um, and Rec Parval, um, also not a lot of blues and reds. Darker reds and darker blues for the initial reconstruction, Rec Int, um, darker reds and darker blues for SNODAS, and a lot of dark reds for the National Water Model Suite. 
Um, now looking at sort of just the nitty gritty of the comparisons with ASO data. So all of the ASO overlap with all these products are shown with date stamps on the horizontal axis here on these graphs. And I'll just bring your attention to the top panel first, which is the R squared value of the different products. So this is how well each product explains the spatial variability on each date of the ASO SWE. You can see Rec DA with the blue, uh, sorry, with the purple square is up at the top across the board. Um, the Rec Parball is um, with the yellow triangle, uh, second highest across the board. Uh, Rec Int with the orange circles. Um, is number three on the list here for the overlapping period. And then SNODAS and the National Water Mall SWE um, are the next two down. Um, you see similar behavior when you look at the mean absolute error with REC DA and REC Parball having lowest mean absolute errors consistently through time. Um, and then in terms of percent bias, which is a little harder to make sense of, but if you look at the box plots over on the right, you can see that um, the REC in and the REC Parball um, or sorry, the REC Parball and the REC DA um, have uh, biases that are relatively close to zero, whereas the National Water Model SWE, for example, has a sort of a consistent underestimation of SWE. Um, now, comparing against snow courses, um, here you can see a one to one line with the reconstruction SWE on the horizontal axis for REC INT, REC Parball, and REC DA. Observe SWE on the snow courses on the vertical axis. And then kind of the take home points are shown with the numerical statistics where the R squared 0.85 and 0.89 were highest for REC Parball and REC DA, and then significantly lower for the other products. If we then look at snow sensors um, and evaluate those same metrics, we can see REC Parball, REC DA explaining 87% of the variability. Um, having lower errors uh, than the other products as well, um, with SNODAS actually having errors that are relatively close, but um, important to notice that the SNODAS data here are not independent um, because these sensor data are actually incorporated into the SNODAS SWE estimates. So that's a very important caveat to make um, with that. But even with that, um, the R squared is still a little bit lower than the other products. Um, the root mean square error um, is actually a little bit higher than the REC DA. Um, it's basically the same as REC Parball. Um, and the percent bias, a little bit higher than REC DA and a little bit lower than the REC Parball. Um, but again, that's not independent because it's incorporating that snow tail data in the SWE estimate. So in summary, um, with my case um, to argue that um, hindsight's valuable, for estimating the spatial distribution of SWE based on the three evaluation data sets, the ranked order of performance is REC DA, that gets the gold medal. Um, REC Parball, silver medal, SNODAS gets the bronze. Um, and then left off the podium are REC INT and the National Water Mall SWE. Um, so now moving from sort of how do we, if, if reconstruction is valuable for estimating the distribution of SWE, um, and we might with REC DA argue that we shouldn't necessarily say writ large that reconstructions are valuable, but that snow covered area information, the perfect, the data that you all are doing such a magnificent job purveying, um, has significant value for estimating the actual mass of SWE, not just the extent, but the mass. But only if we do so in hindsight, only in a reanalysis context. So how do we leverage that to estimate the real time distribution of snow water equivalent and then how do we utilize that to help water managers deal with long-term droughts like 2012 through 2016, um, which are shown on this map, where they want to fill reservoirs? And then how do we leverage that information to help them deal with flood risk like in 2017, where they can't get water out of these reservoirs fast enough without flooding downstream communities? And so it's really a challenging situation that the water management community is in an environment that has this kind of feast or famine behavior when it comes to snowpack, especially combined with the fact that rain, rain on snow is also a significant concern in this area. And so the starting point for thinking about how we can leverage these hindcast reanalyses to estimate 
uh, real-time snow water equivalent, I think the most simplistic perspective is to start by just looking at the correlation between the amount of snow that accumulates on snow pillows. Um, in this case, I'm showing an example for the Southern Rockies domain um, shown over here on the right of this map. And if you look at the say 300 snow tail stations across the Southern Rockies domain, it's actually not exactly 300, but it kind of depends on where you draw the boundary. Um, but if you look at the correlation between those snow sensors and different topographic indices, um, I've ranked those from left to right for this uh, six year period from 2010 to 2015, where you can see the correlation with aspect um, is relatively high. Uh, but it's still, it's only explaining maybe like 27% of the variability um, on, in a, on an average. Uh, the regional slope, um, the Northwest barrier difference, there are metrics that we can derive that relate to orography um, that I won't go into the details of. All these variables represent, for those that are curious, the independent variables that go into the PRISM precipitation modeling system. And we're using those to explain the distribution of SWE and what I want to bring your attention to is this box plot on the far right. This is the historical reconstructions of SWE and how well it explains the, the real-time April 1st SWE variability. It has more explanatory power for the real-time distribution of SWE than any of the topographic variables. In other words, there's some repetition right, in the patterns of SWE across the landscape. And for those of you that you know, look out your building and look up Arapaho every spring in May and June, you can see this in terms of the depletion patterns that you see up in the high country here in Boulder every year. Um, and that the timing of those patterns relates to the magnitude of the SWE. So it shouldn't surprise us, right, that there's repetition in patterns from year to year. And so inherently, if we're trying to explain the distribution of real-time SWE, there's likely value in the historical record and exploiting that historical record to estimate the real-time distribution of SWE. And so that's the basis of Kohan Yang's dissertation work. Um, and she defended her PhD year before last here at the University of Colorado. And what she's doing is developing, um, uh, what she did in this work is develop a real-time SWE estimation system that uses a statistical model with all of those independent variables that I showed before related to topography, and then samples from the, hist the history of SWE reconstructions from the REC DA as an additional independent variable to explain the distribution of real-time SWE and therefore map the distribution of real-time SWE. The dependent variable here is the real-time observed SWE on snow pillows across the Sierra Nevada. That is scaled by the real-time observation of fractional snow-covered area so that it can be brought to the grid cell scale at 500 meter spatial resolution. That dependent variable is related to independent variables associated with all that topographic information that I showed before, as well as an, a sample layer from the full data cube of the historical SWE reconstructions from the Margolis SWE product, which go from um, 1985 to 2016, his reconstructions leverage Landsat observations. So they're actually able to go back further um, to 1985. Um, and Kohan also explored a new independent variable in addition to the historical SWE, which is based on the daily mean fractional snow covered area up to the date of interest. So in other words, if you just look at daily mean fractional snow covered area through time from say October 1st up to if your date of interest is let's say March 1, that daily average fractional snow covered area and how, if you wanna think of it, how white is the pixel through time? Whiter pixels through time in theory might have more snow on them than areas that have been browner through time. Um, and sorry for the, uh, layman's lingo there, but you kind of, I just want to kind of give you a sense of what that independent variable rep represents. So in terms of the data that NSIDC is providing, right, so we've got fractional snow covered area coming into the dependent variable here. We have fractional snow covered area within this data cube of historical SWE reanalyses, and we have fractional snow covered area coming in for the current water year in this daily mean FSCA. So fractional snow covered area is really um, giving us a lot of information here with regard to providing SWE information. 
So I'm going to show similar kind of product bake off here where we've got um, two new models that I'm introducing, the LRM baseline, that's this linear regression model with the baseline application being just with this um, historical reconstruction from the REC DA. And then on LRM FSCA, which includes that historical SME information and also the daily mean FSCA. So two real-time products that we're developing to hopefully improve upon SNODAS and the National Water Mall Suite. And so here are some example maps um, that highlight the interannual variability more recently in the Sierra Nevada, big snow year 2017 on the left, um, and another big snow year in 2019, and then two moderate years in the middle. Um, evaluations against the Airborne Snow Observatory for some example dates that are relatively dry years, 2013, 2014, and 2015, and relatively wet years um, in 2017 on the far right. You can see um, the difference of ASO from SNODAS, where the magnitude of the difference with relatively dark reds and dark blues suggests larger errors. Whereas if you look at LRM FSCA and LRM baseline, the, the darkness of the reds and blues is reduced. Um, the exact same plots that I showed before, but in this case, highlighting the LRM FSCA and LRM baseline in terms of R squared of explaining the spatial variability of observed ASO SWE with those two new products having higher R squared consistently than um, the SNODAS or National Water Model SWE lower root mean square errors, uh, with the exception of a couple of dates where, um, because of the extremely shallow SWE and not much snow on the snow pillows, our SWE errors were a little bit higher than normal. Um, and again, root mean absolute error um, showing lower errors than the two National Weather Service products. And then percent bias, if you look, um, here at these box plots, you can see we're closer to the zero line in terms of percent bias than the two National Weather Service products. Um, if you're interested in how much the daily mean snow covered area improved the SWE estimates, that's what this uh, slide shows. The R squared improves consistently as you add in the daily mean FSCA information relative to the baseline linear regression model the root mean square errors go down slightly consistently through time as well. Um, comparing against the snow courses, so this is analogous to what I showed for the um, reconstruction bake-offs um, here, showing the LRM, two LRM products in the top row, where you can see relative snow courses, we're explaining 86 and 84% spatial variability in snow courses, respectively, versus 0.76 and 0.79 uh, for SNODAS and the National Water Model SWE, respectively. Um, and so whether it's looking at the ASO data or looking at ground data, we show that consistently there's a better performance with the linear regression model SWE than with the SNODAS or the National Water Model SWE. And so what I'd like to do um, in, in the next 10 minutes or so are just give you some examples of how we can bring this information to bear on water resource management in the context of this sort of feast or famine snowpack condition that the Sierras persistently deal with. Um, so first, the 2012 through 2016 drought. Here are some examples of the real-time snowpack information that we were providing um, to what we, we now have uh, about, I think, 200 different water resource management entities on our distribution list that we send these reports out to. Um, this is for May 15th of 2012, showing on the left the pixel by pixel percent of average snow water equivalent. You can see it's well, well below normal. Um, the value for each watershed is shown in the map on the right, where you can see down in the Kern, we were at like 6% of average and up in the Feather, we were 21% of average. And then the, the reports also include tabular summaries. You know, a lot of these users are not necessarily interested in um, actually getting gridded data or having quantitative analysis, but they want to understand just what the percent of average is by elevation band. So for each of the 20 major river basins that are shown 
in these maps, we report the snowware equivalent in inches for each elevation band, the percent of average to date for each elevation band, the snow water equivalent for the previous report, and the difference in SWE for each report. So if the numbers are negative, that represents snow melt. And then we provide the area um, of each elevation band so that the end user has an understanding of what the aerial extent is of that elevation band in case they have a different polygon they're using for their watershed or elevation band, they can compare those aerial extents. Um, now, stepping through the drought, I'm going to show you that April 1, uh, SWE reports for 2012 through uh, 26, uh, 2015. And uh, the maps on the right show the percent of average by pixel. Those areas in brown are well below the mean, down 40% or less. The areas in turquoise are getting closer to the average, which would be 100%. You can see widespread across the Sierra, well below the average um, for this date of, of April 2nd of 2012. This was just at the start of the drought. Uh, for reference, I'm showing the California Cooperative Snow Surveyors, uh, the snow surveyor who's out with a federal sampler. This coupling right here is the first section of a 30 inch long federal snow sampler. So when you see that coupling at the snow surface when it's plunged to the ground. That indicates the snow depth was about 30%, uh, which is well below um, normal. Um, and as you can see, the percent of average by watershed, the feather actually was at about 47% of average, the Yuba at 64. So these numbers in the 60s are actually looking pretty decent compared to the southern part of the Sierra. Um, stepping into 2013, here's the snow surveyor's feet, the, Federal sampler plunged to the ground. Here's that coupling. So that's 30 inch height. So again, pretty shallow snow percent of average for April, uh, in this case, April 15th of 2013. You can see very low, um, as much as 50% of average in the central Sierra, but well, well below that in the northern and southern part of the Sierra. And then on to 2014, here's that snow surveyor. Here's that coupling, that's the 30 inch height. And again, percent of averages ranging from 50 down to um, in the teens in terms of percent of average or even 4% of average for the Thule. And then there was April of 2015, where instead of bringing a federal sampler, Frank Gerke, who's the chief of the snow surveys, brought the governor of California, um, Jerry Brown, uh, the governor at the time, there was no snow at the site. So there was no need to make a measurement. Um, you can see our percent of averages were on the order of 30% of average, um, but mostly in the single digits and teens across the Sierra, uh, one of the lowest snow years on record for the Sierra. And so this drought condition represented just a very, very um, challenging environment with regard to managing water supply. And if you look at kind of the overall condition for the three most acute years of the drought, 14% uh, of average for 2013, 19% of average for 2014, and 3% of average for 2015. And if you accumulate the drought in terms of a total snow water deficit, we estimated um, a total snow water deficit relative to the average sweep. You know, if you think of the amount of snow that would come in each year as being the average, and then you difference how much came in relative to that average to get a snow water deficit. We estimated that average being 54 million acre feet of water. Um, for those that aren't um, in that vernacular of the water resource management community, an acre foot is one acre of land with one foot of wa liquid water on top of it. 54 million acre feet represents about three, between three and four times the average annual snow accumulation for the Sierras. And interestingly, if you compare the increase in groundwater withdrawals in the Central Valley of California to this 54 million acre feet of um, snow water deficit, our colleagues who are experts in groundwater estimate that that increase in groundwater withdrawal was on the order of about the same amount of water. They've estimated about 60 million acre feet of increase in ground, groundwater withdrawal due to the lack of um, snowpack in the Sierras. Okay, so the storyline, and we had funding to study the drought, the storyline changed very quickly. 
And hopefully this video um, will play for you. This is January, uh, early January of 2017. And at this time, atmospheric rivers started to make landfall into the Sierra Nevada, started pounding the Sierras with snowfall. And it really represented a good news when it came to thinking about changes in the drought condition um, in the Sierra. And um, our data products were used in a lot of popular media to show um, just the magnitude of snow that had fallen um, in two atmospheric river cycles. We received an annual average amount of snow water equivalent across the Sierra. Um, that is shown here by these three maps. Here's January 6, kind of before the two major atmospheric rivers made landfall. Here's January 24th after um, landfall. And here's the percent of average April 1 snow water equivalent on that date of January 24th. So by late January, we'd already had from these two atmospheric river systems that came through um, anywhere from double the April 1 average SWE in the southern part of the state um, to 100% of average, so, e so equaling the average annual snow water equivalent. And the low elevation SWE in particular was high, um, anomalously high. These atmospheric river events have come in quite cold. And that's very similar to what's been happening in the Sierras this winter. Um, and that low elevation SWE then represents a potential enhancement of flood risk. Um, in early February, what happened was we had another atmospheric river cycle that came in five degrees Celsius warmer than those previous two. Um, and it represented rainfall to very high elevations within uh, the Sierra Nevada. And the combination of that high elevation rainfall with the anomalously high low elevation SWE uh, really magnified the impacts of the rainfall in that you also had a significant contribution of rain on snow generated snow melt going into the system. So this particular flood wave represented um, a second ranked flood wave on record, second only to the 1997 flood. Uh, five-day precipitation total exceeding 200 millimeters uh, with high rain snow levels. Localized snow melt contributions were massive with deep antecedent anise snowpack um, fully melting over 21% of the watershed that flows into, in this case, the Oroville um, Dam system in the Feather River Basin. Um, this represented a SWE loss of over 200 millimeters, and it was our estimate in a paper that we did with um, Brian Henn at Scripps uh, that the snow melt component represented 37% of the flood wave um, into the reservoir. And most of you probably were reading in the news about this in 2017, that the spillway uh, was heavily damaged once water flowed over and that they had to engage the emergency spillway, which if you see my cursor, represents basically just this dirt area over here on the left. Once this damage occurred, they closed the gates on this spillway and allowed water to flow over here. And the water quickly began to erode away the landscape. And they then began to worry that the entire dam was going to fail. So then they re-engaged this damaged spillway and basically said, well, we're going to let the water just gouge out the side of the mountain over here because that's less likely to cause the entire dam to fail. Um, so that, in the end, is, was the decision that they were faced with. Um, these maps show for the Feather River Basin the change in SWE from January 27th before that atmospheric river event that caused the damage to the spillway um, and February 12th after the event. And then if you look at the difference, these red areas represent the magnitude of snow melt from our product um, that was associated with that rain on snow. Um, so in summary, then, when it comes to looking at this particular flood wave event, um, there is this just dramatic um, signal associated with the rain on snow. And our SWE products were actually being used in real time. And I was having discussions with California state climatologists about the anomalously high low elevation SWE, um, which was enhancing the flood risk. Um, so to wrap it up here, I wanted to reflect back on um, the sort of three eyes of water security and thinking about the infrastructure. And, you know, since I've got a couple minutes to reflect on this, I, I start 
to become quite interested in the history of the Western United States, you know, the snowmelt hydrograph and snowpack water storage and the infrastructure that has been developed to capture that snowmelt, uh, snowmelt runoff in the Western United States, it's been a primary factor in what's allowed the Western United States to flourish throughout the 20th century. And as the climate continues to change, and as that snowmelt hydrograph uh, begins to change and potentially go away or at least be attenuated and reduced in magnitude, um, the institutions that are managing that infrastructure are gonna be faced with an increasingly high number of challenges. And to address those challenges, not only do we need better and more accurate and more accessible information, um, such as you know the this little brainchild that I've shared with you, with you here of like the process that I've gone through over the last ten to fifteen years, you know this kind of problem requires a lot more talented people to kind of dig into, right? We can if we gave um, any number of fifteen different um, experts in this all these different data sets in order to chew on this problem, they come up with many different solutions. And likely many of them would be better than the ones that I've come up with. And so what I'm arguing here for is a, is a rally call for those of us who are in leadership roles to get more and more people engaged in being arrows that connect better and more accessible information to the institutions um, that need that information. And that, like, I have a little bit of a roadmap in my mind for how to do that. Um, it starts with listening. So. Water resource managers are, in many cases, and well, writ large, just extremely talented people that have extremely interesting jobs. And what we need to do first is listen to them and understand the problems that they um, are faced with. And through that listening, develop relationships over long periods of time. And that requires sustained funding. So that's one of the real... I think one of the reasons why my group is one of the few that's doing this kind of work is that we've been fortunate enough to get sustained funding to do this. And when I say sustained funding, I mean like you got to develop these relationships over a decade to really build that trust and get those that are making the decisions um, interested in working with you and um, trusting the information that you're providing. Um, and so emphasizing the limitations of the data that you're providing for them um, I'm always learning about what those limitations are actually through discussions with end users. And so I would um, conclude by um, thanking everyone for their attention and thanking you all for the significant amount of work that you do to be purveyors of the information that's allowed us to engage in this research. And with that, I'll take questions. All right. Well, thanks, Noah. This is really great. Uh, here's a person who really knows his snow, I think. So we've got any questions. Uh, probably best to put them in the chat. Actually, we've got, uh, no, I think you could shout them out or put them in the chat. You everybody. Oh, okay. Well, then put them in the chat. Put them in the chat. No, no, I, I unmuted people. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Steele. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a comment. This is Florence. Um, Noah, thanks very much for your talk. That was fantastic. Um, I, um, well, we have the Snowdows data as part of our NOAA collection here at NSIDC, and it's always worried me because the Snowdows data get a lot of users, uh, and um, a lot of those are hydrologists, and um, I'm afraid that we, you know, we serve them, but we don't have um, the background or the sustained funding to really uh, do the job that I feel that we ought to be doing um, with the SNODAS data. So uh, just in terms of um, being clear about product limitations and um, building trust, I think a key step for us is to make sure at the very least to link to your, um, uh, your latest work, your reports, uh, your website, wh whatever we can do to send the users who could benefit from the products you're developing and have out already um, uh, to 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 that um, to that um, source. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. You know, all we uh, the paper I showed that was from part one 
that had the bake off um, where SNODAS was compared with the Airborne Snow Observatory and the other metrics. That paper is in review now. Um, I can send that along to you once it's published. Um, you know, I think it's it's an interesting question. NSIDC, you know, you all put the citations right to these papers and there's already, I think, a citation there that highlights some of the errors in SNODAS. And I wasn't intending to throw SNODAS under the bus here. Like, you got to have a bar, right, to try to improve upon. And SNODAS provides that bar. And, and we only generate our data in little small pockets of the world, small pockets of the, of the United States, where SNODAS is covering the entire region. Um, so I, I point people towards SNODAS all the time if I don't know of a better data product in the part of the country where they're interested in data. Uh, so I can kind of empathize with everything you just said. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think there should be any, um, you know, it really is about, like you said, kind of building the trust by communicating the errors, like, and, and one of the things with SNODAS or any suite product, it's really hard to know what the errors are. We only now through ASO kind of know pretty well what errors are for the Tuolumne River Basin. Um, we really don't know what the errors in most of these data products are outside of the Tuolumne River Basin. Thank you. Yeah, we hear sometimes from our users when uh, when they find errors, um, you know, anomalous cases. Uh, we have to try to try to sort out, but that's not really our our expertise. Well, I'm happy to help however I can. Other questions? Any other questions? I think Twyla had her hand uh, up. Twyla, please. Um, do we have there? to? Do we have to unmute her? I think she can unmute herself. Twilight, she says can she you? can't unmute herself. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Miss Dia. Um, this was so interesting, Noah. Really appreciated. And I'm wondering if you might just comment a bit more on snow on uh, or rain on snow events and how that has me kind of what evolution that takes in your research, needing to think more and more about liquid precipitation as well as frozen precipitation and whether you're finding a path to um, move towards comments on trends or, or um, expectations or just kind of what, what that interaction um, physical process space looks like. Yeah, thanks. Um... Well, I could speak to some interesting recent work by Keith Musselman. Um, I myself haven't, other than the Lake Oroville paper, we haven't done a lot of research on rain on snow, but Keith had a really interesting paper that based on uh, models showed that as the climate warms, the, the probability and frequency of rain on snow events will initially increase uh, but then go down once the snow's gone, right? So with the, with the, with this sort of an interesting sort of tipping point, right? Where initially you'll get more rain on snow because you still have snow, but then you're getting more rain on top of it because the storms are coming in warmer than they had in the past. And then you pass a threshold where snow persistence on the ground, especially at lower elevation is, is really not there anymore. So then you don't have the snow on the ground that you need in order to have rain on snow. Um, so there's some interesting work from the modeling side that Keith's developed recently, but I think like we need to do a lot more research on rain on snow because the physics of rain on snow are quite interesting in that initially when rain falls on snow, the snow actually has pore space that can capture that rain. So it can actually decrease the runoff response to the rainfall event initially, but then you could pass over a threshold where um, the snow can't hold any more liquid water and then with the latent heat exchange and um, deposition of water vapor on the snowpack and release of latent heat, you can generate rapid snow melt. So we actually need a lot of like detailed process studies um, that like, for example, in our backyard on Niwot Ridge, not the best place to study rain on snow because it's pretty uncommon, but we need a lot more process studies to understand the physics of rain on snow. 
Yeah, thanks so much. All right. Well, we are at the end of our time. So again, Noah, we really appreciate you coming and talking to us today. Uh, we have all these mutual interests in snow. It's a wonderful thing. So, uh, so again, thank you for your time. I think this has been a great, great talk. So, thank cool. you. Yeah. Okay, Noah. Bye-bye. Thanks, so thanks for having me. Bye. 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 Bye.